I'd like you to welcome Father Daniel Mode. I think I heard a moon out there. What a great joy it is for me to be with you. Uh, I so appreciate the honor of being invited. I am currently serving as a chaplain at Guantanamo Bay Naval Base in Cuba. So it's a great joy for me to be anywhere but Cuba right now. I have been serving there for the last nine months, and I have nine more months to go. And this is my first time I'm having leave. So know that it is a great joy to be with you for many reasons. Chief among them, to be a part of this wonderful Eucharistic Congress, and to tell you about Father Capadano. What an amazing, gifted story I'm about to share with you. An inspiring story that has inspired me for over 30 years. As I begin to tell you this amazing account, at the risk of putting you to sleep, I'd ask you to close your eyes as I try to paint a picture for you, a picture that I've tried to paint for myself many years. And that's a picture of Father Capadano's ultimate sacrifice, his death on the battlefield of Vietnam, September 4th, 1967. So again, I invite you to close your eyes as I paint this picture of this heroic man, this Catholic priest, this Navy chaplain on September 4th, 1967. It was Labor Day in the United States. People were running about to the beaches and the last barbecues, having a joyous time before school began. But in a whole nother world away in Vietnam, the war was continuing to rage. And on this Labor Day of September 4th, 1967, Father Capadano found himself 50 miles to the southwest of Da Nang with the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. Early that morning, a small platoon of men of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines was on a typical search and destroy mission, a patrol. They found the enemy, or really the enemy had found them. This small group of less than 100 men found 2,500 North Vietnamese in a major offensive during elections in Vietnam. Obviously, this platoon was quickly overrun, and more and more command elements of the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines were added to this battle that would be known as Operation Swift. One company after the next, including M Company of 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. Father Capadano was with them, at the headquarters when they got the call to go. And they were to go to a battalion aid station that was quickly being set up so that the wounded and the dying could come to a place on the battlefield. That's where Father Capadano needed to be. So he boarded the helicopters with M Company and made their way towards that battalion aid station, literally in the midst of the battle. The helicopter didn't make it there. It was literally shot down in the midst of rice fields so close to the battlefield. Father Capadano got off the helicopter with his men. There are two platoons on either side as they made their way now on foot to that battalion aid station. But between them and that aid station lay the conflagration of war. They set themselves up on a small knoll. On the other side of that knoll raged the battle. On this side, M Company established its command post. Father Capadano could hear the gunfire, the men engaged in battle, and he heard the radio operator calling back to the command post, we're being overrun, we're being overrun, we can't hold out. That was Corporal Lovejoy. Well, Father Capadano couldn't hold out anymore. He had been in Vietnam for 16 months. He had already served with the 7th Marines, was in eight major battle campaigns. He knew what combat was all about. He knew where his men needed him most, and he knew where his sacraments were needed most. And it wasn't on the safety side of that knoll of the hill. He dashed over that hill, found that radio operator, Corporal Lovejoy, grabbed him by the shoulder, and brought him back to relative safety. Time and time again throughout that late morning, and early afternoon, he would do the same thing with the wounded and dying. His first wound of the day was through his right hand. It was shot, disabling his fingers. He was bandaged up, but refused to leave the battlefield on the next medevac. He said, I need to be where my Marines need me most. Oftentimes, the Marines deployed tear gas through the area in order to dissuade the 
North Vietnamese who don't have gas masks to disperse. All the Marines donned their gas masks, save one. He had lost it. Without a thought, Father Capadano took off his gas mask, gave it to that young Marine to continue the fight, while Father Capadano choked back the tears. For that heroic act, he got his second wound of the day in his right shoulder when a mortar went off, now disabling his whole right arm. Again, was bandaged up but refused to leave the battlefield, only saying, I need to be where my Marines need me most. Sergeant Peters was dying. He propped himself exposed to fire on a tree stump. Sergeant Peters would receive the Medal of Honor that day for his heroics on the battlefield. Sergeant Peters was an orthodox man, again dying, exposing himself to gunfire so that he could point out where the machine guns were on the ridge. No one dared go near Sergeant Peters save one man, Father Capadano, who ran to his side despite the bullets, despite his own wounds, to pray with that man to care for them, him in his last hours of life and prayed the Our Father as he died in his arms. After that scene, a Marine shouted out, my gun is jammed, my gun is jammed. Without a thought, Father Capadano took the rifle of Sergeant Peters, ran across the battlefield without firing a shot to give it to that young Marine to continue the fight. The last moment of Father Capadano's life took place near a machine gun nest, where three Marines, one of them being Ray Harton, Corporal Ray Harton, were going to try to put down that machine gun nest that was getting the better hand of the battle. As they made their way there, they were all shot. Two instantly killed. Ray was shot in his left shoulder. A corpsman went to his side, Corpsman Leal, a Navy corpsman. That corpsman was shot through his legs. Both of them now were lying on the battlefield bleeding expecting that the next thing they would feel would be bullets or bayonets. Instead, it was Father Capadano running across the battlefield to them. First, he went to Ray Harton, who again was bleeding through his shoulder. He blessed and anointed him. Ray had just served his mass the day before on Sunday. And he said these words to him, Staying calm, Marine. God is with us all today, and you're going to be okay. Then he ran to the side of Corman Leal. Again, his legs had been shot. He prayed over them, and at that moment of his prayers, Corman Leal was also Catholic. He was shot 27 times in the back. September 4th, 1967. In many ways, obviously, that is the last heroic act of Father Capadano. But in all ways, it is how God uses a person like Father Capadano, not just in his heroic act, but throughout his life and even into his death. Father Capadano grew up in a typical Italian-American family in Staten Island, New York, born on February 13, 1929. He was the youngest of nine children. As he grew up, he was debating on where he should go in life, and he thought maybe a doctor, maybe a businessman. He went to Fordham University, but it was while he was there on his trip on the Staten Island Ferry every morning to go to school, he would read an interesting magazine called Field Afar. We know it today as Marinol Magazine. And he'd read all the amazing heroic stories of Catholic priests and bishops in places like China and Korea and Japan and how they were ministering to people in far-flung places that needed Christ. His heart was moved and he became a Marinol missionary. As a seminarian studying for many years and ultimately assigned after his ordination in 1958 to Taiwan. He was assigned to the most rugged mountains of Taiwan, to the aboriginal people of the Hakka who had escaped China during the communist revolution and found their way in refugee status to these mountains of Taiwan. Father Capadano not only learned Chinese, but this hard dialect of Hakka, and for six years ministered to them in those mountains. After six years, Marinol decided to move him to a private boys' school in Hong Kong. Well, he didn't like that. It wasn't the rugged life. It wasn't a challenge for him. He had heard the need, the great need for chaplains. The Vietnam War was continuing to grow, and he knew he might be needed there. He asked his superiors to go, and ultimately they said yes. He would find himself now 
going ultimately to Vietnam. There again, he served with the 7th Marines. He served at a battalion aid station, and finally with the 3rd Battalion, 5th Marines. Before this heroic moment of September 4th, he had already received the Bronze Star, one of the highest medals a chaplain or anyone could receive. He had been with his men through many battle engagements and got the, the honored title by them of the Grunt Padre. A grunt is an affectionate term for Marines in the trenches. And they knew he was one of them because when they had to hike, he hiked with them. When they carried 40 pounds on their back, he carried 40 pounds on his back. When they were sweating in the heat, he was sweating in the heat. When they had to stay up at night to take patrol and point and be on the listening post, he stayed up at night. When he would write home to family and friends, he wouldn't tell them about his life, he told them about their life. He asked them for what they needed, like food and peanut butter and space blankets, cigarettes, things that they could use. He was always giving of himself a quiet, humble man who cared for his Marines unto his own death. Indeed, Father Capadano was a hero of the faith way before he ever was a hero on that last day of his life. He had requested three separate extensions to stay in Vietnam. Normally, you only stay there for 12 months. After his 12 months, he requested an extension, got another six months. And it was during that third request extension to stay in Vietnam, especially through Thanksgiving and Christmas, that he was killed. That letter did arrive, but it was denying his request. Ultimately, Father Capadano gave his ultimate life for his men. He stayed with them. I wrote a book about Father Capadano. It's called The Grunt Padre. And at the very end of that book, talking about his whole life, I tell this story. After his death on September 4th, 1967, it affected greatly, especially the area of New York where he grew up. And one man who used to teach in school with him when he was a seminarian read the story of Father Capadano's death. He hadn't been to church for a long time. And because he was so moved by the heroic aspect of Father Capadano and knowing him, he decided it was time for him to get back to church. He walked into the church, told the priest why he was there and wanted to go to confession. And then the priest, kind of amazed at this whole thing, said, well, why? Why are you coming back? And he told him the story of Father Capadano, and then he said these words, and again, it's at the end of the book. I guess a missionary doesn't stop working even after he dies, does he? I guess a missionary doesn't stop working even after he dies, does he? And Father Capadano hasn't stopped working. I knew Father Capadano only through stories. And that story started in the summer of 1989 when I became a Navy chaplain. It was there in Newport, Rhode Island at our chaplain's school where everything seemed to be named after Father Capadano. The ship in the harbor, a fast frigate, was the USS Capadano. The chapel we prayed in every day was the Father Capadano Memorial Chapel. The street we ran on with our Marine drill instructor was Father Capadano Street. I soon discovered that there were other chapels named to him, statues on Staten Island to his honor, and he received the Medal of Honor. There were buildings to his name. He was so famous. Well, I was working on the time as, at a master's degree in history, and I needed a thesis topic. And I thought, he's so famous. I want to be a Navy chaplain. This will be a great topic. I'll write it about Father Capadano. Well, I quickly discovered that almost nothing had been written about this heroic man. Obviously, we knew the details of his death through the Medal of Honor citation. And there was a simple three-page magazine article in the Marine Corps Gazette that was done a couple years ago, but no definitive biography. So I quickly discerned, I'm not going to do this on Father Capadano. I need to choose something else. It only had to be 30 pages, after all. And where would I find the time to do all the research? Well, it bugged me. At night, I rolled around. And I thought, what compelled him to be on the battlefield that day? Why did he want to become a priest, a marinal? Why did he serve in Taiwan? What propelled him to be a Navy chaplain? And what propelled him on that day to give the ultimate sacrifice of his very life. And then I thought, why did I want to be a priest? Why did I want to be a Navy chaplain? Why do I want to 
offer an aspect of service. Well, it bugged me enough to begin writing the story and researching. For two and a half years solid, I discovered the story of Father Capadano. This goes back before the internet and cell phones. Slowly, I found the people who knew him on the battlefield. I put a free ad in the Marine Corps Gazette, the Leatherneck, the Navy Times, Marine Corps Times, hoping that somebody would see this very small ad. If you knew Father Capadano, call this man. It was a payphone that we used in our seminary. On the other side of the hall, 40 guys used it. Over 100 people called. One of them was Ray Harton. Remember, he's the man who Father Capadano ran to him and said, you're going to be okay, Marine. God is with us all today. And he did live. Well, Ray answered that ad, called. I wasn't there, left a message. I wrote him back. I didn't hear from him. Now, that happened to a number of veterans. They didn't always want to tell their story. It was sacred, and it was difficult. I realized that the story I was writing was much more than just about this man, but was about the hurts and the needed healing of the Vietnam War. I realized I was not only touching something of a man's life, but many lives, and it was a sacred moment. Again, I didn't hear from Ray, but I heard from many others. I'm going to get back to Ray's story a little bit later, because I ultimately did hear from him. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to tell you what happened on the battlefield that day. Ultimately, after three or two and a half years, I wrote my master's thesis, and it was finished. And I got an A, by the way. Well, again, a missionary doesn't stop working even after he dies, does he? I thought I was done, I got my grade, I got my degree, and I went on with my life. As an pa uh, associate pastor at a parish in Arlington, Virginia, where I'm from, and every week I get a, a letter or two. Hey, could I have a copy of that thesis? Would you come and talk to our parish? I was amazed at how many people wanted to hear about Father Capadano. Over the course of four years, 250 copies were Xeroxed and were sent out. Ultimately, I moved to a high school. I became the vice principal of Bishop O'Connell High School. And I got a call the very week I began my ministry there. It was from Mother Angelica herself. And she said, Father Mode, would you come on my show, the live show, and tell the story of Father Capadano? And I said, sure, I'd be happy to. That was in 1996. Now, I actually didn't have cable TV in the rectory, didn't really watch that show. I had no idea the amazing effect that it would have. After I went on her show, the phone lines lit up, and more and more people wanted to hear about Father Capadano. Now enter Ray Harton. He had heard, again, years later, Again, this appeal about Father Capadano, and decided to reach out to me. Now, I was back at the high school, and we had email back then, and he emailed me, are you the same Dan Mode who was doing this research so many years ago, which was about 10 years ago? He goes, I go, yes. He said, can I come and see you? I said, any time, Ray. He said, how about tomorrow? I thought, is this guy in my closet back here? Where is he at? He drove 12 hours from Georgia to meet me. He hadn't told a soul this story not even his wife. Ten years ago, when he got my letter asking if he could be a part of this research project, he had so many amazing flashbacks. Flashbacks that brought him back to that day of September 4th. He had survivor's guilt. The corpsman, the chaplain, both killed, and he lived. Why? He had tremendous guilt. And when he got that letter from me ten years before, he took out a revolver, shot himself in the same left shoulder where he was injured in Vietnam, trying to commit suicide. He would find himself for a year in a VA hospital recovering from that wound and other emotional wounds. He finally got the courage to reach out to me 10 years later. He drove up, told me that story, and told me the story of the battlefield. Well, Ray today is back in the Catholic Church. He had left the church, again, having the survivor's guilt, I'm not worthy. I blessed his marriage, and he is now wonderfully offering his witness and testimony to veterans that there is hope. And Father Capadano helped him. Father Capadano can help others because a missionary doesn't stop working even after he dies, does he? I just saw Ray on September 3rd when the Archbishop of the Military had his annual Mass in memory of Father Capadano at the Basilica of the National Shrine in Washington, D.C. 
even though he's quite disabled and much older, he brought up the gifts in the procession at that Mass. Beautiful story of Ray, but so many others. I could go on and on about the numerous veterans I've met, some who never knew Father Capadano, who've been touched by his story, and it prevented them from committing suicide. It, it helped them through their issues of alcoholism or depression, and how they are coming together now in a spirit of hope. A missionary doesn't stop working even after he dies. One of the greatest joys of my life over these many years that I've had Father Capadano in my heart is all the vocations that I've known that have come through his witness and story. One of them being a Nashville Dominican. Her name is Sister Vincent Marie. She was named after Father Vincent Capadano. She was an army captain serving in the DMZ on the border of North Korea and South Korea when she was discerning her vocation. And just like a typical army captain, she wrote out her desires. She looked at five different religious orders that she would go to, and she executed the orders. She said, I will go to these five orders, and if I'm not inspired, God's not calling me. The very first place she went to was the mother house in Nashville, Tennessee, of the Nashville Dominicans. She walked through the door. They knew she was coming from the army, and they gave her a copy of the Grunt Padre. And she said, this is where I belong. She read it overnight, and years later, when she made her final profession and took her name, she asked if she could take the name of Vincent after Father Vincent Capadano. A missionary doesn't stop working even after he dies, does he? Obviously, some of the more incredible touch of Father Capadano in people's lives have been the miracles. There have been 11 miracles dedicated to his name. All of those are being investigated as we continue the cause. This cover was Father Capadano's cover hat in Vietnam. It is a relic, if you will. And we bring this to different people who have been ill or sick, who are in most need of his prayers. One of them was a Marine three years ago. I'm not gonna tell you their names because we're still in the investigation process. But he was a Marine, he had esophageal cancer. My father died of esophageal cancer. I know what that's like. It's a death sentence. It's one of the worst cancers you can have. Active duty Marine, Captain Camp Lejeune, right here in North Carolina. He asked if he could have the cover. His family had been praying through his intercession. He was already on his deathbed. The doctors only gave him a few months. They received the cover, they prayed day and night as a family. Within three months, that Marine was back doing PT. He is still alive and with us today, and it's a miraculous healing. There is another beautiful miracle, a sister in Vietnam, a Vietnamese sister. They work with homeless orphan children in a very rural part of Vietnam. She had ovarian cancer. She was sent down to Saigon, which is now present-day Ho Chi Minh City, where they discovered the cancer and did not give her much hope. They said, your only hope is to go up to Hanoi, where we have better doctors. They'll do surgery. They'll do the cancer treatment and the radiation. But we don't hold out much hope. It's rather extensive. She then went to uh, Hanoi for her treatment. But in the meantime, the sisters began praying through the intercession of Father Capadano prayed over her and with her. A few months later, she made her way to Hanoi to begin that process. They did laparoscopic surgery to see where the tumors were and how to conduct the surgery. And they searched and searched. There was no cancer. She was totally free. Ultimately, as an act of thanksgiving, she flew to the United States, met with a Vietnam, Vietnamese, Vietnamese priest in Newark, New Jersey, who had a great devotion to Father Capadano. He brought her to the grave of Father Capadano, who was buried in Staten Island, and they prayed over that grave in Thanksgiving. Just weeks after that, I fly to Vietnam from Japan. On that flight was that Vietnamese priest from New Jersey, who I'd never met. I'd heard the story that this was happening. He embraced me and said, I can't believe I'm seeing you, and we're both going to Vietnam now. I'm making a pilgrimage to the site where Father Capadano was killed. He was going to that orphanage. Next to him was a man, his name was Joseph, who travels with him from his parish. The man stands about six foot four, 
and around his neck is a medallion of Father Cappadano with a vial hanging from it. The vial is dirt from the grave of Father Cappadano. They couldn't believe that I am with them on this flight to Vietnam. He took off the vial and gave it to me and he said, place this dirt from his grave on the place where Father Cappadano was killed, which I did. A missionary doesn't stop working even after he dies, does he? One of the persons I got to know through this who was with Father Cappadano on, his, on the day he died is a lieutenant, Fred Smith. You may know him as the founder and CEO of FedEx. But on that day of September 4th, he was a lieutenant in the Marine Corps. He knew Father Cappadano well, and it was at, at that death that inspired Fred Smith to re-engage in his faith, to re-engage in a purpose in life. Ultimately, he would say that it was Father Cappadano's example and witness that propelled him to take that risk so many years ago to found that company. Well, he wanted to talk to me about Father Cappadano. When I met with him, his story is in the book, The Grunt Padre. Well, when I was meeting with him, I was the vice principal of this Catholic high school, and I was building a beautiful pro-life memorial there. And the center of the memorial was a statue of the Holy Family that we were having carved in Carrara, Italy. But the shippers couldn't guarantee that it would be there by the end of the school year for our dedication. I had an issue, obviously. A big statue, about a ton. Now I'm going to meet with Fred Smith. After he tells me this amazing story of his encounters with Father Cappadano on that day of September 4th, literally he's crying, telling me this story. He says, Father, is there anything I can do for you? Bing, light goes off. I said, Fred, I've got a ton of a problem. I've got this statue in Carrara, Italy. I need to get it here to the United States. 48 hours later, it was FedExed. True story. A missionary doesn't stop working even after he dies, does he? I could go on and on, but I only have five more minutes left before I need to leave and offer the next speaker about the amazing gifts that I have seen through this heroic man in this life because of the life that he gave. Father Cappadano is truly a missionary for our time, a hero for our time, a needed witness and example of faith for our time. Probably one of the most moving stories, and I'll close with this, is a chapel that wanted to be built in Taiwan. As I told you, he served six years there. And in his letters home to his family, he said, these poor Hakka people have no chapel. They live in these mountains, unaccepted by the people of Taiwan. They're migrants up there. I wish I could build a chapel for them. So after his death, obviously, so many people wanted to offer memorials. Tens of thousands of dollars was gathered in the late 60s for this chapel to be built. Designs were planned. Money was gathered, all of it needed to build this chapel, but no chapel was ever built. Ultimately, I discovered this through my book. A copy of the thesis in the book went to Taiwan. A man, a marine old priest who knew Father Cappadano when he was his pastor in Taiwan, read the story, discovered that indeed, here's a ledger where it was supposed to be built. Here's the money that was received, but no chapel built. In 1995, that chapel was built. And just two years ago, I had the privilege to go to that chapel in the mountains of Taiwan, where the Hakka people are still there and reverence his name. Because a missionary doesn't stop working even after he dies, does he? I've had the privilege to stand on the battlefield in Vietnam where he died and offered mass. It was quite a pilgrimage. I was a Navy chaplain at the time, serving as the command chaplain of the USS George Washington, an aircraft carrier. And our job was to go around the Pacific to different ports. It was difficult enough to get permission from the military to go to Vietnam, let alone go to Vietnam, and then to find the exact spot where he was killed and to offer mass on that spot. To this day, the Bishop of Da Nang, which is the diocese in which that is, has an annual mass to honor Father Cappadano. Imagine this, a communist country, a country in which they're still smarting from the Vietnam War, where thousands of people gather in the cathedral of Da Nang to honor a Vietnam veteran and a Catholic priest. All the seminarians of his diocese in Hue City, 150 of them throughout the diocese of Vietnam, pray to Father Cappadano's cause every single day. 
and just less than three kilometers from the site where Father Capadano died, a chapel is going to be built in his honor and memory. A missionary does not stop working even after his death, does he? I had the privilege to stand in the very first parish Father Capadano served in Taiwan. I went to Hong Kong, where he was there for a year, and prayed at the very desk he wrote the letters asking his superior to go as a chaplain, praying that I may always have courage and witness as a Catholic priest and a Navy chaplain. I went to the very pier, Fenwick Pier in Hong Kong, where he used to stand as the Navy sailors would come in for their leave. The very first time he was ever on a Navy ship was the USS Boxer, and it was from that pier, Fenwick Pier, that he rode out as a civilian to offer mass for them. What an honor and a joy for me to be there. I was in the very room where he spent his last night in the United States with his sister Pauline. I have made my pilgrimage to touch the reality of Father Capadano's life that has so touched me in my life and my ministry. Now I invite you, I invite you to be touched by his life because a missionary doesn't stop working even after his death, does he? I'd like to invite you to pray with me the prayer for the cause of Father Capadano's sainthood. He has been declared a servant of God back in 2006. I have been the postulator for his cause. I'm now on the historical commission. And probably within a month, we're going to take the cause from the diocesan phase to the Roman phase, having finished up all the historical work and the documentation that's needed. It's been a long road, but a road worth walking. And this prayer has been uttered by many. If you'd like a copy of the prayer, in the back at one of the stands, we have a Father Capadano table. It not only has the prayer, but pamphlets about the guild and copies of the book, The Grunt Padre. But as I offer this prayer, and as we close today's talk, I want you to place in your heart an intention. An intention for somebody who's on a battlefield right now. It might be you. It might be a friend or family member. It may be somebody you don't know that you want to place in your heart. Could be a service member. Could be a young person who's battling whether he has a vocation or a young woman. Place that person now in your heart as we pray this prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. May God, who has offered healing and strength through the hands of his only Son, our Lord, and through Christ's many servants, grant me the favor of his healing hand through the intercession of Father Vincent Capadano, priest, missionary, and chaplain, who always sought to heal and comfort the wounded and dying on the field of battle. May I be granted this request on my own field of battle, I pray, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Amen. One last a missionary doesn't stop working story. Last night I had dinner with your wonderful bishop and he told me that just recently, last week, at a priest conference for your diocese, all the priests gathered, he said, if any one of you wants to go to be a chaplain in the military, just ask and I will send you. Because a missionary doesn't stop working even after he dies, does he? Christ peace.